Welcome to Starkey Sound Bites. I'm your host, Dave Fabry, Starkey's Chief Hearing Health Officer. I am really excited about today's conversation. We're going to dive into artificial intelligence with a world renowned expert on the topic of AI who also happens to have a hearing loss. Dr. Seth Dobrim was IBM's first ever global chief AI officer, and in September of last year, he founded Quantum AI. Seth, Thank you so much for joining us here on the podcast today on Starkey Sound Bites, and I'm really excited about our conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. I always enjoy chatting with you. Well, let's, I don't even know where to begin. I've got so much that I want to fit into this time, but um, let's start with your hearing loss. Um, we've talked about this in the past, that uh, your wife, Tabitha, had been telling you for some time that you needed uh, to consider using hearing aids. Why is it that you waited? Because I think you waited almost 10 years, didn't you? Yeah, I waited quite a while and probably more than that. I mean, we've been married for over 20 years and more than half our marriage, she's been telling me I needed a hearing aid. So it's it's been a while. Um, you know, it was, it, well, it's a stigma, right? I mean, there is a stigma associated with hearing loss. It's, I think it's gotten less and less or hearing aids it's gotten less and less over the years. But, um, you know, it was, it was really the stigma of wearing hearing aids. You know, my my great uncle wore hearing aids and it was so long ago that he'd take his glasses off and he'd say, I can't hear you. I have my glasses off because they were attached to his his glasses. Uh, but that was who I always saw as people needing hearing aids. So I just resisted. Yeah. And it's it, your your journey is not an unusual one for most people in the U.S. Uh, it's about a seven to 10 year period from the time someone either suggests that you get a hearing test or maybe you should you should go and see someone and talk about it to when they actually get hearing aids. And so um, it's not uncommon. And, I, and like you said, I would agree. I think traditionally the stigma surrounding hearing loss and especially use of hearing aids um, has really been a big barrier to people in their mindset. And in many cases now, um, as hearing aids have gotten smaller, and, and I think, I, I'm biased, I think they've gotten a lot cooler. But, um, you know, I, I think that we've still seen that the traditional generation, those born before World War II, has some of that stigma involved with them. But what we've seen with the baby boomers and younger uh, is that they may be less stigmatized, but they have higher expectations for what hearing aids can do. And I think you yeah. fall squarely into that camp. And yeah, they have very high hear, you know, expectations, and uh, and and for the most part, they they live up to them, right? And and just to be clear, I'm not a baby boomer. I'm 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 the Gen Xer. I so. know you are. That's why I said <laughs> I'm the baby boomer, and uh, and you're definitely a Gen Xer. I know. And you know the the issue. You know, I've been fortunate to really um, sort of know you as you've been on the more recent part of your journey, and and we've been through several sets of devices that uh, you've been kind enough to um, provide feedback to me uh, as to where we are and where we're going. And the thing I, I, I really have to say, first of all, is thank you for the radical candor that you provide about where, where, uh, where I'm doing well in, in terms of the way that I'm using the technology and where the technology that Starkey has is going and where we, where we succeed and, and uh, where we have opportunity to do better. But before that, let's talk about your experience when you first started to use hearing aids. When when did you first get them? Uh, so, twenty mid twenty twenty. So it was right after COVID and the masking started. Yep. Uh, so you know it's been three, a little over three years probably now. Yep. Um, and one of the drivers for it, well, there are two main drivers for it. So or maybe three. So one, the first is we talked about it already. My wife has been telling me you need hearing aids for a long time. The second was masks. I, you know, I always knew that I read lips. I just didn't know how well um, and how important it was for me to, you know, to hear, quote unquote, hear people. Uh, and so I really was having trouble hearing people when I was when I was out and about, you know, the mask plus the barrier. So the barrier that was between everyone, all the plexiglass and stuff made it even worse. <clears throat> And then spent a lot of time at home. I travel, you know, most of my time, especially when I was at IBM, I was traveling around the world. And so, you know, spending a lot more time sitting next to Tabitha on the couch. And, you know, one day she looks over me and she says, you're either ignoring me or you're deaf. If you're ignoring me, we're getting a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so 
Thankfully, you made the right decision. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So uh, she didn't quite say it that strongly, but I think that's what she meant. (laughs) Um, So I went to my audiologist uh, and did our my test. Um, And you know, when when Frank came back and said, you know, gave me the results. At first, I turned to Tabitha. I'm like, "See, I told you so." And I'm like, "Oh shit, I need hearing aids. How can I say that? (laughs) I need hearing aids." Um, and, uh, and so, you know, it was kind of mixed emotions that, you know, I, I wasn't, I mean, I didn't think I was ignoring her, but, you know, sometimes <clears throat> you do things sub- subconsciously. Um, and, and I tell you, I, I got hearing aids and a friend of ours owns a restaurant and he was having a, a party for his a birthday party for his girlfriend. And we're sitting at a table. Most everyone's wearing masks, like 12 people. And I'm in the middle of the table and I turn to Tabitha and I'm like, Oh my God, I can like hear everyone. Mm-hmm. Like, and she says, yeah, I know. And I'm like, you know, I can hear exactly what they're saying. And she goes, yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> and so like that, and that was the night I got them. And it was yeah. instantaneously, you know, almost life-changing instantaneously over the last three years has definitely been, been life-changing. And you and I have spent quite a bit of time talking about that. We have. <laughs> and um, what would you say has been the biggest impact maybe that that social situation where you're in a restaurant and able to hear that that's certainly one of the top drivers is performance in background noise but is that the biggest success that you would say over the last so roughly three I months? would actually say no I would actually say the way I function overall is better I'm not tired mm-hmm. as much at the I mean I'm not exhausted mentally at the end of the day the way same way I used to be mm. Uh, and, and I attribute that a lot to really trying, spending a lot of time, especially when I was out with customers or, or, or my team, you know, talking to people, it was very exhausting for me. Uh, and, and so I don't really have that anymore. I mean, it's still tiring when I'm six time zones off or something like that, but not the same, same level it was. So that's, that's the, probably the biggest you know, impact. And then I've seen some little things that were surprising for me. Like, you know, I think I talked to you about this and I, you know, I thought I was kind of off the wall. You know, I used to have trouble driving at night because I couldn't see. And, mm-hmm. you know, about six months ago, I'm like, I, I can see at night now. I can drive at night, which I had to, wouldn't even attribute to that. But you said that's fairly or not uncommon, I guess. I don't know about fairly. Yeah, fairly it's, common, it's, it's you know, we talk about the top drivers for people that are considering getting hearing aids for the first time. And it's certainly hearing soft sounds and hearing speech and noise, making sure loud sounds are never uncomfortable and spatial awareness. And I think that's really what I attribute your observation to is that now you're hearing in that automotive environment and you're hearing more completely as you're driving and you're integrating in the same way that you mentioned vision and hearing is important uh, uh, for, you know, your lip reading without even your know, subconsciously, p- people will sometimes say, oh, I'm losing my hearing. I need to learn to lip read. And I said, you've been doing it your whole life, but now it's just been more important to that. But I think similarly, the spatial awareness, uh, we say you don't hear with your ears, you hear with your brain. And it's that integration of multiple modes, if you will, that's contributing to that sensation that you're seeing better at night because of the spatial awareness. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so what, what hearing aids do you have now? So, uh, well, I have the, the new ones in right now. So the, the Genesis, yep. right. And then right here on my desk and not just for this call, I have the, the previous, the Evolve. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you notice they're both colored. Yeah. And that's um, what and I, I wanted and to and go I do to. That. That. Whoops. There yep, we go. There it is. And I, do, and I do that so that. You know, when you know, I spend, you know, we talk about me traveling about half the time I'm traveling, I'm on stage yeah. uh, giving presentations. And I almost always start out the presentation talking about and talking about AI. And I'd start off by saying, you know, this is very personal for me. Are we hearing aids? And most of the time I pull them out and, and you know, and they're filled with AI. And I talked about a lot of the ways that, you know, Achin and I have talked and you and I have talked about all the AI that's that's in them. Uh, you know, like sampling the environment every six milliseconds and, and adjusting and, and and some of the translation that it can do, albeit slowly now, but hopefully eventually faster. Um, and I talk about that, and this is personal and why it's important that I trust the company who's doing my hearing aids because they hear everything. They hear my personal conversation. They hear, you know, proprietary conversations I have internally with my company and with my customers. And so, so I talk about it all the time, plus because they're colored and they're not normal ones that go behind the ears. Every time I go through security or every other time, they're like, 
take your your AirPods out. I'm like, well, they're not hearing aids. I mean, they're not AirPods, they're hearing aids. And then they get all the you know, yeah. all, all <laughs> apologetic. And I'm like, don't worry about it. But I mean, so I, I intentionally, you know, I, for me, it's, I'm trying to reduce the stigma by letting people know first that I wear them yeah. and I'm, you know, not, not a, not, not old, but I'm not young either. Um, and kind of sharing some of the cool things they do and how they leverage technology, like, you know, streaming directly from phone calls from them, watching videos. I mean, it's, I don't even, you know, acknowledge half the things they do anymore. Yeah, I, I well, first of all, for those who are listening to this rather than watching it on our YouTube channel, okay. Seth um, showed me that he's got a pair of black ITC custom rechargeable Genesis AI devices that he's wearing. And then he has another set that is all white. And it, it was where I was going next. I'm glad glad you brought it up because I really appreciate and, and, and love the fact that you wear the ones that are not matched to your skin tone um, because you want to, you're, you're not trying to hide it. You're wearing custom devices, which many people assume people want to hide uh, the devices, but you're sort of celebrating it in the way that uh, you hearables uh, by uh, drawing attention to it so that then I would imagine, like me, you then nerd jack the conversation with some millennial and tell them about all of the features that they have. Yeah. Yeah. In all fairness, though, the first pair I had were skin tone. Yes. Um, and, and I still have those. They're, they're my, my backup, backup pair. Uh, and so, but I went from, you know, I think you and I had a conversation and you said with the white pair, would you mind being more, you know, you're already talking about them. Would you mind, you know, see, you know, a pair of white ones or something? I said, sure. I don't, I probably wouldn't do red, but I'll do, I'll do other colors. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. And um, so then <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about some of the features that you like best on the latest product. We've talked about the fact that you travel constantly and yeah. uh, we're in the, the with with the Genesis AIs. We're the, we're in the second generation of rechargeable devices, and the first generation, I, I think, in our industry, you know, miniaturizing these batteries, transitioning from replaceable zinc air batteries, where the end user is in control of replacing the batteries, but. You know, you think about people, older people, or people who have manual dexterity issues or arthritis. Um, rechargeable is easier, but then in that first generation, we can sometimes see people develop range anxiety, where especially for someone who's flying across the ocean or traveling long uh, distances, would run out of uh, battery at the end of the day. Yeah. With so, so uh, you know, I think a couple things. The other thing, the other type of person with, that doesn't want the battery are lazy people like me. I don't want to have to have to worry about it. So I look at it the other way. If it's battery, I have to worry about it, right? right. So I think the uh, the Evolve would last me somewhere around 18 to 24 hours nonstop. And, and fortunately, you know, pre, uh, pre-pandemic, pre-supply chain, uh, you know, the cases had battery in them. And so when I got on a plane, I would just take the case out and set it down next to me um, and, um, and could recharge them. But there's some times where I'm working through the flight and I've been up all day and and I have had them last 40 hours. Yeah, on the Genesis. The yeah, so, yeah. so the Genesis. And that's not just in my heat ear. That's, you know, taking phone calls. That's listening to music. That's, you know, so, so you know, I think that is completely amazing when you consider that a pair of AirPods, you know, can't even last eight hours. Um, and then the other thing that I find very interesting that most people who wear hearing aids probably don't know is, you know, the technology and how you pass the the connect the the hearing aids over your head and not through your head because water, which is ninety percent of your brain, brain yeah. right, slows down and fat. You know, the fat in there is even worse. Slows down any kind of waveforms going through your head. Plus, it might not be healthy. Yeah. So the technology to actually pass it over your head is completely you know, amazing for me and, 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 re and really, and how does that know. impact you for people that aren't familiar with it? So when you have user controls on these devices, for one thing. Yeah. So, so I have user controls on them so I can, you know, I can turn the sound up and down. If you're watching the YouTube, I accidentally turned it down. So I turned it back up. Uh, I can start and start and stop music and phone calls by tapping. Um, and then, and so that's some of the things is that the user controls on these, these in the ear, uh, in the ear custom devices have. And so in terms of how the over the head works, so the Evolve or the Genesis are better than the Evolve in that. And I can tell because when I use the Evolve, if I have my phone in one pocket 
and then I move it to the other pocket, mm -hmm. it, it gets kind of, it kind of breaks up a little bit and you can kind of tell there's something, something wrong. Um, that doesn't happen as often with these new ones. So that's, that's one thing that's gotten better. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that I like is that you can, there's a mic that I can take when I talk, take phone calls, I can use the mic in the hearing aid. So if I'm in an airport, I can keep my phone in my pocket and still talk to my wife or, or whomever. Um, and so, you know, so that's, that's one thing I like. The other thing that when you first sent me these pair and you said, you know, you wouldn't tell me what was different. Mm -hmm. Right. And mm -hmm. you said, tell me what you said to me, yep. turn around to tell me what's different after a week. Yeah. And the reduction in background noise is amazing. Um, and because of the type of hearing, a, lo a hearing loss I have, I didn't really have an echo problem, or at least I didn't think I did with the in-ear the devices. But I noticed that actually got better. I was hearing myself less. At first, I was hearing myself more. I told you you made some updates, and yep. then I actually started hearing myself less. Um, I think those were the biggest changes that I noticed. Yeah. Um, in these in these new ones. Uh, yeah. yeah the, over, the other one over. that a lot of I think we have talked about in the past, and a lot of other patients who've switched from let's say a previous generation Livio or Edge or Evolve to Genesis is how quiet they are when the, in the in a low ambient environment. Yeah. <clears throat> they're they're very quiet, and I think we've talked about that. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So that. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I think um, I didn't didn't even think I don't even think about that. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. That's well, smart. you know, the issue with the battery life and the rechargeable, I think providing that option for still having replaceable batteries for those people who want to be in control, but then for those who want the ease of use, and I'm I'm in the same camp of rechargeability. And I think, you know, there's a little bit of a environmental benefit. Uh, you know, we still have to dispose of those lithium ion batteries eventually, but during the time you're not disposing of batteries, uh, uh, you know, uh, as frequently. But I think our real goal, and Achin and I talk about this along with the R&D team, is those the best technologies are those that are ubiquitous and they just are sort of part of your life. You just set them and forget them and you just put them in and you don't have to think about it and you don't have to worry at the end of a long day. If you've got 41, 40 hours uh, you know, of use, including streaming time, that's where we are today, but you're still going to have all day use three to five years from now. And, and so we want to take the battery life worry, the range anxiety off the table. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to see some more compute heavy functions and I'll take, you know, half the battery life because yep. I'm not very often up for not many people are up for 40 hours straight. Right. No. And let's uh, transition I'm into that because, you know, we've talked about AI and, and that's where we're going to go into next here a little bit in greater detail, because I really want to have the audience be able to be the beneficiary of your expertise in terms of artificial intelligence. But Edge Mode is a feature that we've incorporated that is designed to personalize the devices beyond what the automated processing, where we're using machine learning to adapt the devices throughout the day. Edge Mode actually takes advantage of an onboard DNN accelerator to start to look at personalizing to the individual's uh, uh, challenging listening environments. And talk a little bit about, because, you know, even though you are deeply a tech guy, you also are a person who just wants to put the devices in and just wear them without engaging yeah. with them more than you have to. Yeah, and so when I first, when I got my first devices, I would use edge mode. And I think I complained about having to tap it twice all the time because I wasn't using it right. Um, and so I was, I was, and it, the, the underlying problem was actually that my hearing aids weren't set right for what I needed. And so I was using edge mode to try and overcompensate for that. Um, once we got them set right, I don't think I ever use edge mode. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any value in it really for me at least. If we got the um, if we've got the acoustic set properly, um, then if it adapts to your world in all of those challenging listening environments, that is really the goal: ubiquitous kind of performance yeah. and connectivity and battery life. And I have tried using it on a plane, but the problem with the plane is that the sounds adjust all the time, and so it's not really. I don't think edge mode works well for that. So I use yeah. like I've adjusted. I have a I use a crowd mode for that, and that works pretty well. Yeah. Um, on a plane. Yeah. Um, and so, so I don't use edge mode at all. 
Um, especially knowing that, you know, having the, you know, having, like I said, having the conversations with you and Achin about, you know, all the, the sampling, I think last I talked to him, it was every six milliseconds, yeah. which is, which is just amazing that on this teeny tiny little device, you can have the power to, to do that and, and still have 40, 48 hour battery life. Right. Yeah. And, <laughs> so and you don't have to in, you engage with the devices. And that's really, that's one of the objectives in using machine learning and AI and deep neural networks, but Let's pivot then from your experience, and thank you for that feedback, and I appreciate the ongoing feedback and where we get it right and where we can improve. But um, let's first, before we dive into that, let's talk about your background in AI. When, when, you know, what first got you interested in this? Yeah, so I got interested in graduate school. So my PhD is actually in human psychiatric genetics, um, and I was doing it during the towards the end of the Human Genome Project, and we had tremendous amounts of data. And this was in the late '90s. Mm -hmm. uh, tremendous amounts of data, even even by today, it's large data, right? So you know, for those of you who understand different sizes of data, it was my dissertation was about 100 gigabytes of images and and and, tab, and numbers, and so. And I had never taken a computer programming class. Um, and so I had to teach myself how to code in order to analyze all that data because back then Excel was limited to 65,000 columns and 10,000 rows. If I had to do it in Excel file, it would have been hundreds of Excel files. Yeah. Um, and so I had to learn how to do programming and how to code and, and started using machine learning uh, back then, and machine learning is just a type of statistics. It's actually, when we think about machine learning, it's just statistics that's applied and continuously learned. So statistics is static. Mm -hmm. Machine learning continuously learns. And, and it's the same, all the same math, literally. Right. Until you get into things like deep learning or neural networks, like you mentioned, or into the new, you know, new the new AI, I call it the old AI pre-2023, and new AI, was, it's really all still related, though, but that's just kind of tongue-in-cheek. Uh that's getting into net new math. And that's, that's, uh, so, so I got into this, I'm getting off course a little bit, uh, got into this in the late nineties, kind of as at, out of need, mm -hmm. uh, and been applying it in both startups that I worked at in academic situations at research institutes and at fortune 500 companies. Uh, and now I've taken that uh, and really focused on the business strategy of AI and my company quantum AI. Yeah. And when we first met, you were the first uh, chief AI officer at IBM. And, yeah. um, you know, you've talked about a lot uh, on YouTube talks and I think even TED, I think TED Talks too, you've done. And um, yeah. on sort of responsible AI and how AI, big tech is transforming AI. Can you, can you, for the uninitiated, can you, and maybe even those who are a little wary of AI, can you give us a boiled down explanation of AI and big tech and then even where you're going with responsible AI? Because we're yeah. you know, involved in that so, company so, as well. So so that's a really good question, especially when we think about most everyone has heard, at least heard of chat GPT. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are very, very large models that are trained on essentially the whole of the internet um, and including some of the worst parts of the internet. So like a lot of how these models learn how humans communicate is through Reddit. And if you're not familiar with Reddit, it's basically a free form conversation, you know, place for conversation, there are subreddits. Now the downside to that is it's, you get the worst of humanity on there too. <laughs> Uh, and they start talking about all sorts of things, misogyny, misogyny race, racism, bias, hate, misinformation, all of these things that, you know, you wouldn't want uh, uh, an AI to learn. But because it was trained on that data, as well as other data on the Internet, it actually learns this this bad behavior. Uh, and so the math is not biased. Computer programming is not biased. All the biases comes from the data that these models learn from machine learning. Uh, and all that information comes from us as humans. And so I always, you know, it's it's basically a mirror on human, humanity. And oftentimes when I end talks or podcasts, I often say, if you don't like what AI is doing, look at yourself. Yeah. Because everything that you're doing on the Internet uh, is feeding into that. Yeah, and that's what I find comp particularly compelling about the way that you describe this and approach it, because you talk about really responsible AI as 
being essentially human centric. And, and, yeah. and so, as you said, reflecting humanity for all the good and bad that it is. And you also mentioned chat GPT. I mean, I will say that I've used chat GPT to streamline abstracts for, for papers that I submit where, you know, if I, if they have a 250 word uh, maximum and I'm at 312 words, I will dump in my prose and say, make it, boil that down, get it to 250. And it does a pretty good job of that. But then when I think of human centric, the gray areas, how do I, how do I remain true to myself while using a tool like chat GPT to solve problems for me? Is that still remaining human centric? Well, so there's 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 two parts to this. So one is our consumer apps like ChatGPT or similar technologies, and I use it literally every day. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I teach a master's level course at a university in New York on how to use this. So I, the topic is AI safety, mm -hmm. but throughout the whole course, it's how to use generative AI, and you know, no cheating exists in the class. There's no such thing as cheating. Use every resource at your disposal, sure. including these these tools. And I, in fact, gave a had a conversation with the professors at, at CUNY Baruch, which is where I teach about how they can use it. And they were amazed, right? Building curriculums, doing tests, doing, doing all these things. And so kind of encouraging them to let them use their students. So there's these con consumer facing ones. And so when, when Dave or Seth use chat GPT, you know, the human centric is really in the, in the, in the GUI in our perspective, when I'm talking about human centric, or I've actually started talking about as human focus now, I'm really talking about how businesses use it. So how Starkey would leverage it, mm -hmm. for instance, right? So when you think about how you're going to use AI, you have to start with the human. So who is the human that's going to be using the AI? And who's the human that's going to be impacted by the AI? In the case of hearing aids, they're the same person. But if you look at like a mortgage, if I go to a, if I go to Quicken Loans, which is where I, we've always gotten our mortgage from, or Rocket Mortgage now it's called, and I get a loan, they're gonna use AI. So the underwriters and the mortgage brokers are using AI, but ultimately I'm the one that's impacted by the AI. Yep. And so when you're designing an AI system for like credit, you know, for lending, you need to understand the human that's the both humans. So you need to understand who's gonna be using it because they're not gonna start using it unless you're designing it for them. And then you need to understand the specific impacts of the humans that are going to be that are going to be impacted by or specific ramifications of it or potential harms. And when you do that up front, it enables you to understand things like bias. Yeah. Uh, so what are what are the protected classes is what we call so groups of people that we don't want to be biased against because you'll never be able to eliminate every bias. In the case of lending, it's you know age, race, gender, ethnicity. Uh, and so you need to keep that up front and and, and really understand that. What do I need to do to explain the outcome? So explaining the outcome to you or Achin is different, different than explaining it to my dad or your mom, mm -hmm. right? And so you need to understand what explanation looks like to them. Um, and, and in the case of bias, right, bias, and this is something that people don't think about, bias is actually a social construct, and so bias in the Western world is fundamentally different than bias in Asia mm -hmm. or the Middle East or Africa or South America. And the example I always use is, you know, in the U.S., we worry about racial bias and ethnic bias. If you go to Asia, there is, for the most part, no racial or ethnic bias. Mm -hmm. Right. And so different construct of what bias is over there. I was giving a presentation the other day. Uh, at, at a, for a bunch of executives, and there was a, a woman from India, and I was talking about this, and she said, you know, most most Westerners don't talk about this, but like in India, it's gender bias, it's caste bias, and it's what schools you went to, right? So those are all driving bias in India, and if we design AI without thinking about the human and where that human lives, we may think we're controlling bias, but we're actually not. And we're propagating biases that are important for that region. And if we don't do this, we're gonna increase what we call the digital divide. Yeah. So usually it's north of the equator, south of the equator, but but it's, there's other things. And, and also the socioeconomic divide because we're designing these things for people that are middle-class or better. We're not really designing these things for 
social, you know, economically disadvantaged disadvantaged people. So we need to think about these things while we're designing the AI. That's oh. what I mean by human focus. Yes. Yeah, so many good points in there. And then, you know, I do have to comment, you know, you mentioned at the start that when you're wearing our hearing aids and we're saying we're using machine learning, we're starting to use DNN um, and we're learning, it's learning, but you know, we are a class two, m most hearing aids are class two medical devices. And so we, we are required in terms of data privacy and patient confidentiality to, to I want to set, the, the, set the, the, the stage first that we're not monitoring uh, and recording what you're hearing. But, you know, it, it, one of the issues and one of the concerns when you start talking about responsible AI and, and, and ensuring the ethics of this is that with the class two medical devices versus an over-the-counter type hearable um, that isn't encumbered by that same degree of of certainty that that data privacy and and you're not recording things and monitoring things. You know how do we how do we deal with that as we live with a world where there is both prescriptive devices and where there are an, a, a OTC devices and that may not be yeah. as restricted in the way that they monitor data. Yeah, so I think as a class two device, you need to adhere to HIPAA. Yes, right? of course. Yes. And so, uh, and so, whereas the over the counter don't because they're not considered med devices directly, you know, yeah. same kind of level of med device. Yeah. Uh, and most people don't understand how HIPAA applies, but it really only applies to certain devices, providers, and insurers. So, people who you're giving, you know, who, who are responsible for your health care in some way. If you give your health, your health information to someone who's not, doesn't fall into one of those categories, there is no HIPAA protection. Right. And so they can essentially do whatever whatever they want with, with your data. Um, and, and so I think the first thing we need to do is educate ourselves. So how is our data being used? Read to terms of service, understand as best you can, use chat GPT or some other tool to tell you what's, I mean, you can put something in there and say, hey, Zoom just updated their terms of service. Are there things I should worry about? And, mm -hmm. and it will tell you. In fact, back in March, mm -hmm. Zoom updated their terms of service. And they actually, you were agreeing when you use Zoom to let them record every single conversation, use it to train their data. They basically took ownership of even proprietary information that was being discussed in Zoom calls. And yet everyone swipes by the EULAs. Everyone, and do you yeah. read the EULA agreements on everything that you enter? So into? I scan through them. Okay. Yes. I think there's a couple companies I trust. Like I generally don't do that for Apple. Um, I generally don't do that for Microsoft. I mean, I generally trust that they're doing the right things. Yeah. Uh, but with I do have a, a, a prompt. So with the way you interact with these generative AI systems like ChatGPT is you interact with that through prompts. And I have a prompt that's built to read EULAs and pick out certain things from your end user license. End user, I was just going to say, yeah, I, I use the acronym too. So thank so, you. Yeah. So I have, I do use, you know, these tools to interpret uh, end user license agreements for for me. But you know, that's a good point about about the devices. People are often saying, well, you know, you're paying all this extra money. You have to go to an audiologist. Um, well, first of all, I mean, most of your listeners know you don't have to go to your audiologist very often. Um, right. I mean, mm -hmm. I go see Frank, my audiologist, because I like them half the time. <laughs> um, and um, and you have certain, you know, the in, in order to be a med device, a class two med device, you have to meet certain guidelines beyond just, uh, you know, beyond just the data privacy, which is important in terms of, you know, understanding the different harms, understanding, you know, different failure modes, things like that. And so, uh, you know, my hunch, and I've never used a pair of OTC over-the-counter hearing devices, is that the the prescription ones are, are, are going to be more reliable, more robust, um, and certainly from the data perspective, I you know they're, they're, you have no choice. I mean, I, right. I say I, I trust you, but you have no choice. Right. Well, you we get, have to conform to HIPAA and then find out of business. Yeah, and then also just you know just closing the loop on the discussion about bias and bias globally, regionally differs in the same way the 
compliance differs. You know, MDR and, and EU requirements are different than HIPAA, even more restrictive in many ways. And so yep. we have to, as a global manufacturer, we have to conform to the data privacy and, and regulatory requirements in all of the areas where we do business. But I think the point you raised very importantly is considering with uh, training for AI models, and it's, it's not the math, that's biased. It's the data that's going into it. And also the regional differences is something that we really need to think about moving forward, how it is that we're optimizing for different locations around the world where we're doing business. Right. And then on the different ge geographic data protection, there's 27 different data protection regulations in the U.S. today. Right. In uh, the U.S. And there'll be 50 yeah. The, yeah. in the U.S. There'll be 50 in the, by the end of the next two years. And so that makes it even more complicated. So yeah. And so, you know, we have to go to the to the highest watermark, and that's one of the issues. And, you know, the last question I'll ask on this, and then we, we need to wrap up. I see I've already used more time than I promised I would take of you. But, um, you know, the, the issue of you bring up OTC and prescriptive approaches. You're a technology guy who could easily adjust these devices yourself, yet you could go to, you know, you choose to go see Frank, your audiologist, and then we do telehealth from time to time, just if there's anything new I want to try out on you. Um, and um, uh, why is it that you choose to continue to use and go down the prescriptive path rather than an OTC path? Um, well, a, a few reasons. One is, you know, I am, while I understand the technology probably better than most, I'm not an audiologist. I'm not trained in this. And, you know, much like, you know, AI can be, can, can, you know, AI can pass the bar exam mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. I don't want an AI defending me in court. I want a human attorney defending me in court, much like an AI can pass, you know, the medical exam. I don't want an AI practicing medicine for me. I want to interact with my doctor and I want her and I to make decisions, hopefully based on some AI. Yep. But it needs to be a conversation between her and I and my situation and her experience and and you know what's right for me. And so so and, you know, not I'm getting off tangent, but not really. No, I you know, don't think I so. because because you and Frank are professionals, I trust you to A, answer some questions as to why certain things might be happening, and then B, make the adjustments that that fit that. And and plus also if I go into my audiologist, they keep the old record. So if I screw something up, they can roll it back. Yeah. We can't we can <laughs> undo, undo if we need to. But yeah. But yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I just, uh, I, I, I didn't know what you were going to say, but I was curious about that because from a technology standpoint, you can certainly handle it. But I, I've heard you speak before about, uh, you know, AI now, AI next and AI never. And one of the things you say, and you just repeated it with a physician, you want them to use the tools that AI can provide. If they're a, uh, uh, looking at um, uh, radiology uh, uh, files and monitoring them over time, AI can do a great job of looking for small spots, yeah. but then you still want the plan uh, for what, how you're going to intervene to be made by a human. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, to your point about, you know, AI plus humans, you know, I think it's anytime and we can maybe wrap up on this if, if we're done. Anytime AI impacts the health, the wealth or the livelihood of a human, a human needs to be involved in that conversation. And so you can't you shouldn't drive a, a decision from AI without a human being involved if it impacts one of those three areas. See, you just keep dropping these little pearls. And so now I can't end it there because um, one of the questions really relates to predictions for the future. Either what, what, what it would be, and they're, they're, here we will wrap up. What are your predictions for the impact of AI in the future? It can be related to hearing aids or the other part that you just mentioned that triggered this for me is the future of AI in the workforce. You know, when there are jobs that AI can do more accurately, like you just raised with radiology on that part, that's going to eliminate potentially uh, or, or change a workforce. Is this, uh, are we looking at something in the future where we all have universal basic income and AI is yeah. doing the hard work on some of those repetitive tasks? What, what, what's your prediction for the future in hearing aids of what you want and for AI and the workforce? Yeah, so so I'll start with AI and the workforce. So net AI is going to create no more jobs, right? So the total number of jobs that'll exist, I think, are going to go up because of AI. A lot, a lot of that's going to be new jobs. 
The thing we need to be mindful of as a society and especially as employers is that there are also going to be a significant amount of jobs that are going to go away. And it is our obligation as as employers to make sure that these people who's the two things that we're very upfront with them if we're bringing in an AI to replace them Mm -hmm. and that we are retraining them or upskilling them so that they can participate in the economy of the future um, and their children can participate in the economy of the future because you typically you see especially in in blue collar jobs low lower skilled jobs children tend to do the same things that their parents do and so we need to make sure that these people participate in society are able to participate no no one wants to not have a job right right, for the most part people want to be productive uh, so we're not going to turn into Wally as long as um, long as employers do their part, and that is an obligation in my mind that they need to do. So, so that's that, that's my my short answer of that. We could have an hour long yeah, podcast on that yeah, conversation yeah. alone. Um, in terms of what you know, what I I think there's two different things. What I would predict for AI for or for hearing aids, and what I'd like to see. Um, mine's probably a little bit you know kind of bespoke top desire because of all the traveling I do. I'd like my hearing aids to translate, you know, within, you know, half a second in my hearing aids without needing my phone, uh, even if I have to preload a, a certain language. So that's my, that's my, uh, my number one uh, request. Noted. Um, <laughs> noted. <laughs> You've heard it before. Um, I, you know, I think in terms of the technology, you know, they do a really good job now. I think, um, you know, I think getting a smaller form, the smaller form factors to have similar battery life mm-hmm. would be would be really good. Um, I think, um, you know, some some things that are nearer term is like, you know, now on Apple devices, you can use them on your I can use connect my hearing aids to my Mac or my iPad, mm-hmm. but I need to do it manually. Right. right. It doesn't just like AirPods, it just automatically goes across. And this is maybe more of a Mac thing than it is a Starkey thing. But uh, so so something like that, where it's more seamless to your point about not even knowing that I'm using them. And, and I suspect more, I predict more stuff like that, where hearing aids become less and less of something that you think about and just more and more a part of your your life that you don't even you know like something else you don't even think about like your heart beating yeah. right um and then the other thing is that would be really cool is you know a- again most people probably aren't aware of this but one of the best places to take uh you know kind of medical information health information about a human is in your ear yes right blood pressure heart rate respiration rate things like that so more of that stuff in the hearing aids and i know you're smiling because you guys are working on this stuff um, but then also like my dad has Parkinson's, uh, and during COVID and things like that, a lot of medical, uh, you know, a lot of diseases or conditions can be predicted better from a device in your ear than they can anywhere else, uh, because they hear you, they, you know, a lot of these things, Parkinson's and COVID and Alzheimer's and other diseases, you can tell by changes in voice patterns that someone's coming down with them much sooner than you could with any other. So, so really more getting more, since you're already a class two medical device, right. getting more into the, the, you know, predictive and, and, you know, pre, you know, getting earlier interventions because the earlier you're getting intervention for a lot of these things, the better your long-term outcome is going to be. Music to my ears. And uh, we're going to have to have you back sometime to talk about the health and wellness aspect or a cast, which is coming and just right around the corner that will enable that more seamless transition out of Bluetooth low energy as you move from your computer to your phone, even, you know, to the hearing aids alone, as you say, with the, your wish for translation. And can't wait to talk to you more about that and demonstrate some more of that to you as, um, as we uh, deliver it to the market. So, Thank you so much, Seth. I've thoroughly enjoyed our conversation and appreciate so much you took the time today. To our listeners, uh, thank you for listening to this episode of Starkey Soundbites. And if you enjoyed this uh, conversation, please rate and review us and like us. Um, Share it with your network, your family, your friends, anyone who might be interested in uh, Seth's background with AI and also the perspective of someone who wears hearing aids. We'd also like to know what's on your mind. If you have questions for our hearing experts or have ideas for future episodes, send us an email at starkeysoundbites at starkey.com. 
We'll be featuring your questions and getting some answers from our experts on future episodes. We'll see and hear you again very soon. And thanks again, Seth. 